Hello, and welcome back to my reviews of Doctor Who Flux, this time for episode 3, Once Upon Time, which is a very similar title to Twice Upon a Time, the 12th Doctor's last episode. Now, don't let my indisposed nature give you the wrong idea. I enjoyed this episode quite a bit more than the other two that I've reviewed for Doctor Who Flux. If you're curious what I thought of episode 1, The Halloween Apocalypse, and episode 2, War of the Sontarans, you can find them on my channel. I have a playlist doing that. This one is going to be a bit different because I did not catch this one on cable, I forgot to. I thought I set it to record the episodes as they released, so I was planning on that. I didn't catch it at the airtime because I wanted to watch it later and be ready to conduct notes. Uh, it did not record, and there was a moment of panic for me, but uh, I was saved by AMC+, Plus, a uh, online streaming service that airs the episodes of Flux as they air. And I managed to get a seven-day free trial, and I was able to watch this episode to do this review. So, the thing that's special about this one is I recorded my initial reaction to the episode as I watched it. And throughout the episode, as I conduct my review, going through all the notes and the scenes, what I liked, what I didn't like, uh, I will be inserting my initial reaction to the scenes and what I had to say, my witty uh, remarks. And it should be a lot of fun. And if you want my cliff notes for this episode, I am going to, as I always do, go through every single scene, talk about it, and give a concrete depiction of what the episode was and how I felt about it. But just to have a complete picture of this episode, uh, right here at the start, basically, uh, toward the beginning, I was confused because this one is a very confusing episode. It plays with a lot of ideas. Uh, there were some elements that I didn't like, and uh, some elements that across the whole series that as we're learning about more and more throughout the course of the episodes, I realized that I really didn't like them and I thought they were kind of dumb, but I think the dialogue in this episode is way better. A certain character gets a lot more attention and he gets developed a lot more, and there's one specific dynamic in this episode that I liked a fucking ton, and I think this resolution was very good, and actually the setup into the next episode, all of this, this just felt like it had the most focus out of any of the episodes in Flux so far. Which may sound like treason because A, it's Chris Chibnall's run of Doctor Who, and B, if you've seen this episode, there is a shit ton going on that does not get explained. So I'll try my best to give my thoughts on how I felt about it as it went on. I of course have my inserts from my initial reaction to the episode that I will cite whenever I need to. Oh, also on a brief aside, apparently Everyone and their mother thinks that War of the Sontarans is the best Chris Chibnall episode yet. And I have to ask, is everyone insane? <laughs> no, I'm joking, but seriously, I had so many problems with that episode, I don't see what people see in that one. Uh, stuff like the theme of the episode, Generals Are Bad, is fucking absurd and pointless. Uh, dialogue backslides into Chibnall's typical uh, explain everything 12 times over formula that I really didn't like in the course of season 11 and 12. There's that one scene where the Doctor brandishes her sonic screwdriver and the Sontaran doesn't realize that it's her despite the whole scene implying that we were supposed to believe that this Sontaran does not know that she's the Doctor. That was fucking dumb. And the resolution, the idea that Sontarans need energy for their fucking suits in order to breathe the earth air. And of course, the decision to make the general explode all the Sontaran ships for no reason. Stuff that we've encountered over and over in Chibnall, and everyone said it was terrible. Yet here, it's brilliant because, I don't know, there's serialization now. So everyone is brainwashed into thinking it's good. I don't know. I, there were some elements of War of the Sontarans that I liked because, of course, I, I did comment on those scenes that I did like. Most of it, I thought, just did not work. But yeah, that's my little interlude on... Uh, how I still feel about War of the Sontarans. I think it's an awful episode. Pretty much typical for Chibnall, but this one, I think, is a objective improvement in a few facets that I'm going to get into now. Also, when I insert the clips of my initial reaction, I am wearing a uh, navy and maroon sweater, so you'll know when you're watching the initial reactions to the episode when I'm not wearing this very hot hoodie. And when I say hot, I don't mean it looks good on me. It is very hot in my room. So anyway, once Upon Time, Episode 3. For the cold open, we get a new character, Belle. Belle's story? What? Is this Beauty and the Beast? Uh, this character has shown up out of nowhere, and I don't mean that in an objectively bad sense. 
You know, I obviously have my woes when we get new characters injected in a massive story with so many threads already. Is this a new character? Are you serious? So I was a bit skeptical seeing this new character right out the gates. I was very afraid that the uh, story would derail and become super convoluted, which didn't end up happening. But my initial reaction, I was like, oh god. I'm two minutes in. Uh, but she's kind of the third line throughout this whole story. She's a... Uh, Basically, her story takes place after the Flux, so the Flux happened in episode 1, and then we had some weird stuff going on now, the story is happening in the aftermath of the Flux. Basically, the entire universe is in chaos, you know, planets are ruined, war is breaking out, and we have people called the survivors of the Flux, which are people that have survived the Flux, naturally. And Bella's one of them, she's kind of just this scavenger, and we get some expository dialogue on these uh, new villains, which is basically... Uh, clusters of bees that eat people. It's not actually bees, it's just destructive molecules of time that destroy everything they touch. Uh, those are around throughout this episode, and we start getting some details about what those might be later on. Uh, we see Belle running from Daleks, which felt way out of left field, but they're there, and they're having war, as we can expect. And throughout this scene, Belle is monologuing to a person, we don't know who that is yet, talking about basically what has happened since episode two, that the flux is now over, uh, there are survivors, these molecules are going around eating them, and the Daleks are here, and we're supposed to be rooting for her throughout the episode. So that was our cold open with Belle. Okay, so that was clearly just an expository cold open, and I'm going to be very pissed if that character doesn't serve a larger function other than expositing the new scary villains I'm supposed to care about. But I do think this is the best 13th Doctor theme, as I've said before, and I think it is enhanced by the fact that we do have cold opens back. As for how I actually felt about the exposition, uh, yeah, I had my woes, of course. I don't know why Daleks are here all of a sudden, and I uh, was hoping that it would get explained. I didn't have a ton of faith that it would, uh, it just kind of felt like more convoluted uh, mysteries to be solved at some point later on. But in retrospect, I went back and watched the beginning of it again. Uh, most of this makes sense given where it is going. <laughs> I am already so hot, I gotta turn on my fan. And then after the title theme, we get, uh, we're back in the normal progression of the plot. We see the Doctor, Yaz, Dan, Swarm, and Azure, where we left off in this temple of Atropos with the Mori and him with snapping his fingers, Azure's counting down. We had this whole cliffhanger going on. And then, uh, basically, we get some, uh, something derivative of Heaven Sent, uh, you know, with the Doctor slowing down time, uh, solving a problem in a millisecond, uh, monologuing to himself. We don't see that in the Doctor's storm room. We see she's just monologuing over slow mode footage, which I felt was just an obligatory downgrade from the Heaven Sent scene, but, you know, it's, it's nice to have it, I guess. Are they doing a Heaven Sent thing? I'm so angry. And then in super duper slow motion, the doctor saves Dan, and yeah, as he grabs them both, we have this whole big slow mo scene. And then we do some funky cutting, and then all of a sudden we're in this big purple void place, and the doctor's falling. We see Dan, Yaz, I believe it's just those two, and we also see the Mori. So this is what is known as a time storm, where basically we don't know a damn thing about it other than that it is a device to make this episode's uh, plot happen. Weeping Angel appears, Jodie Whittaker. How did you get here? Wait a minute. So naturally, we see Yaz and Dan uh, disappear from this place so they can go have their own little subplots. Again, continuation from War of the Santar and this whole idea of let's just fabricate all this stuff right at the beginning, have no finesse to it, so that we just have these obligatory ways to get people into subplots. Uh, I felt like this whole gimmicky idea came out of nowhere. Obviously, even more so considering uh, where we came from with War of the Santarans, we had this whole big action scene with Swarm and Azir. We had this big antagonistic moment, and uh, Swarm is going to kill Yaz. And then two seconds in, we're somewhere completely bonkers doing things that are entirely different. So uh, that kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. Obviously, we have to see where this is going, naturally, with every episode of Doctor Who, but on my initial reaction, I was like, okay. So yeah, we have this uh, time weirdness deus ex moment where everyone gets zorped off to their own little subplots that are about to follow throughout the episode. And then following that, we see uh, the Doctor, uh, Vinder. Oh yeah, I forgot. Vinder is also there. I forgot to mention him because uh, he is a new guy to the crew. 
Sorry, I'm trying to get comfortable. It's very stuffy in this hoodie. Yeah, we see the Dr. Vinder, Yaz, and Dan. They're in there. You've seen it from their promotional marketing stuff on social media. They're in this big uh, guns. They have these guns, and they're all different. And the Doctor is inserted into this scene. She's wearing her new coat. They did not make a big moment out of that, so that was an improvement. Good job, Chris. Granted, this is a past Doctor, as we're about to find out, so uh, it wasn't actually a new wardrobe that they've added into. If they did do that, if they had a big moment where the Doctor chooses a new coat, I feel like that a scene like that is unavoidable. But uh, since this is from the past, uh, you know, there's no big moment. So there was that, and the Doctor is inserted into this scene. She's looking around. We have no idea what's going on, naturally, so she's asking questions. Aerial. Aerial and now complete. Show that we can... uh, what's going on? Who are you? Why are you wearing that stuff? And uh, no one is acting the way they should. Uh, my immediate impressions was that we were doing a whole Inferno bit, where these are evil versions of this character, and throughout this whole deus ex time fucky uppiness, that we're having some sort of alternate reality happen, and that these are all alternate versions of our characters, and we're gonna have a big moment with that. Uh, evil versions? Alternate this? reality? And that would make sense, given the title, Once Upon Time. This is a what-if scenario, a whole turn left kind of thing. So that was my initial thoughts of what that was. It did not turn out to be that. Uh, I'll explain it later. But yeah, we have some more expository dialogue where uh, it turns out that these characters, who are not Yaz, Dan, and Vinder, naturally, because that would make sense going forward, are sieging the Temple of Atropos, which is where we were at the end of Episode 2. But this is from, like, a different time period. We don't exactly know what's going on at this juncture. I will explain it when we get there, just so that, you know... We have a concrete depiction of how this episode progressed, but we don't know why this is here, and we don't know what the hell is going on with Yaz, Dan, and Vinder, and why they're acting like this. We don't even know why the Doctor is just kind of rolling with this. Like, this whole thing is just kind of a brain fuck moment. So the universe can function again. God damn it. Expedition dump. Stop, Jody! Uh, and then we cut away to Dan in uh, the present day. He is talking with... Actually, I need... Doctor Who Flux characters. Diane. Her name is Diane. It's not Deborah. Damn it. I knew it was a D name. So her name is Diane. And so this is Diane. This is Dan's love interest from Earth. We saw her in episode one. Uh, they're meeting. They get coffee, which is, which is where we left them off in episode one. Seems hey, it's her from episode one. one of those. I am so confused. I mean, I guess this is an improvement because I want to know what's happening, but... Am I boring you? No, I don't know if it's a particularly course, good mystery. Sure. Because this just sort of happened, like literally right now. Uh, and these characters have some flirtatious dialogue where they're just having a nice exchange. These guys have good enough charisma, I think, and John Bishop has some nice scenes. Uh, we see these uh, menacing beehives again, we're just running around. In the sky, uh, Dan notices them. Again, we get no explanation to that, so we are going to find out what's going on there later. But we have a nice scene between these two uh, and then to follow that we have a time jump scene where they're sitting uh on a, some steps somewhere outside and they're still having an exchange but it's nighttime now and in this one scene i think it is an exact template of how inconsistent chris chibnall's dialogue can be where we have on one side dan's dialogue who has this really really subtle intricate exchange about how uh, he used to have a family and whatnot and, uh, you know, we have some nice intimate dialogue where he struggles to get past the words, and it's obviously a very, uh, sentimental piece of his memory that he's digging up. And this is the well-written bit, and then we have Diane on the other side just saying, that sucks. You couldn't bear spending the rest of her life with me, so I suppose you could do better. I can't, Bruce. It's life, in it? I love how Dan's dialogue is good and hers is like, that's bad. So it's like half and half. This is the perfect scene to demonstrate how inconsistent the writing is. Which doesn't match the energy of the scene at all, naturally, as you could gather. Uh, maybe it's supposed to imply that she has no social skills, which would make sense if that was true, but she obviously is perfectly fine being flirtatious in these past scenes, as we established literally a scene ago. So this felt just like inconsistent dialogue. Uh, and then Jodie Whittaker appears as a hologram. Is this Forest of the Dead? In the computer. I'm blocking it, but it's trying to break through. Donna! That would be the hell of a hell of a plot twist. All of this is inside the computer from Force of the Dead. Dan notices her, questions why she's there, 
And then we cut away to uh, Yaz and the doctor in a police car. And they're wearing police outfits. The doctor is in a police outfit. Uh, and she's having a funny Yorkshire accent uh, run-on sentence moment with Yaz where the audience laughs at Jody's funny Yorkshire accent. Dude, what is going on? So it is alternate reality. Alternate reality episode. Uh, and then some static appears, and then the Doctor is a completely different character. So we can assume at this point that uh, basically this is some sort of alternate reality where uh, these characters are being replaced with uh, the Doctor, Yaz, Dan, and Vinder, depending on who we're watching in their little alternate timeline thing going on. At least that's what I assumed first watching it. But it's very strange, and it, it makes almost no sense. All this is just happening, by the way, guys. This doesn't make any sense. Why? Uh, and then out of nowhere, we see the Weeping Angels in the rearview mirrors. Bruh. This is the weirdest episode I've ever seen. Uh, and then we cut away. So there was our little scene with Yaz in the police car. Uh, and then I have a comment. Uh, trying to call out what this episode's plot is, because this is the first time I was actually kind of stumped as to what was going on, and I couldn't call it right away, which was interesting, and that's the kind of thing with these new uh, Flux episodes. We have some mystery going on, and we don't have all the answers right away, and uh, it creates the illusion of plot, but my problem with the old episodes is there was nothing compelling me as a viewer to figure out what was happening because it didn't really relate to any of the characters that I cared about. It just kind of felt like a mystery box with a bunch of intricate pieces that I was supposed to follow because, I don't know, I'm a fan of Doctor Who. Uh, but this time around, we have a really complex episode where we don't know what's going on, so I say um, alternate reality for all the characters, but it doesn't mean anything so far. It's just happening for no reason. Even though I have good things to say about this stuff after seeing where it goes, it's important to note that this happened out of nowhere with like one setup scene all of a sudden we're just following seven different plot points with alternate reality characters and uh mysteries and the mori and a time storm and hologram jody whittaker popping in and out it is very confusing and hard to follow so i wouldn't blame you if you didn't miss any of these details watching it for the first time uh, and i think i forgot to take a note initially of vinder's first scene in his alternate reality where we see yaz in a big officer's Thing, giving a lecture. Yaz is not talking like Yaz, naturally, so we can assume that these are not the characters that we know as they've been established, but he's getting a big pep talk from his sergeant about something that we don't really know about. Uh, and then we cut away, we're back with the doctor in this time void thing with the Mori talking to her. We have some expository dialogue about how the doctor doesn't know what's going on and she needs to figure it out and the Mori are cryptic and aren't helpful at all. Time storm. Time storm? What is this shit? Then you've got a lot Why to is this around? never... Bruh. And then we're back with this uh, alternate reality doctor with her new coat. Uh, back on Atropos with these uh, big gunned out versions of our characters that we uh, have been following. And then uh, we kind of get some answers here where we see uh, the doctor look into a mirror and see Joe Martin, the fugitive doctor from pre Hartnell. So, uh, <laughs> as if I couldn't figure it out... Uh, Jody Whittaker, my savior, explains to me that she is the fugitive doctor, and this is happening in the past. I'm you, which means this is my past. <laughs> Thank you for telling me, Jody. I could have figured that out. So we're following the doctor in the past. Uh, Jody Whittaker is playing Joe Martin's doctor, but she looks like Jody Whittaker, uh, just so that she can have a lot of lines. Uh, but that's the first time we get some definitive answers as to what's going on in this episode. And then we come back to Dan in a mine somewhere. And this one feels super out of left field. Uh, especially having, you know, watched it. And in retrospect, this makes no sense, you know, going forward. But in this scene, we get Liverpool Man returning. <gasps> it's Liverpool Man! Liverpool Man! Why Holy shit. Getting... He better be in one scene. For his one scene, and I do mean that, he is in one scene. So, three out of six episodes, this man is in one scene in every episode. Thank God, Chris Chibnall. I think he is actually intentionally putting this man in one scene in every episode. So, uh, I'm glad I called that immediately, but he's in this scene, uh, and he's talking not at all like he talked in uh, episode two. He 
has very modern dialogue, which I don't know if it's inconsistent dialogue or an intentional decision considering how mind-fucking this episode already has been. Maybe this is an alternate version of Liverpool Man. Uh, he has a laser gun, and we see the menacing bees return. They fly past, uh, but he comes in here for a very strange exchange with Dan that I honestly didn't love, but it's Liverpool Man. He's in his one scene in this episode. Uh, and this, I don't actually remember, but I have a note. Dan and Doctor Hologram Vision. I don't remember the scene. I'm assuming it's just another scenario where the Doctor is appearing as a hologram for Dan, and he doesn't know what's going on and asks questions. So I doubt I'm missing anything there. But after that, we get uh, Bell's return from the cold open, this new character. Oh, Bell's back. Great. Basically, our big anchor for the plot going forward, she is uh, having a story that's actually happening. Uh, this is following War of the Santarans, as we've already gathered, but she's having a big old space escapade, looking at all the dead planets, and she has some nice dialogue, I'm gonna be honest. I think she was written well, but her uh, random injection to the story felt super duper weird. Uh, but she has some dialogue talking about how the Flux uh, destroyed all the planets, and she has some nice little remarks about how everything's dead, there's corpses everywhere. Time is fucking nuts right now. Uh, and my immediate comment in this moment was uh, uh, Bell scenes, I think, take place in actual time as opposed to these alternate timeline things that we've been following. But the thing with that is we don't have any answers as opposed to where the hell any of these plot points are happening. So the thing with this, there's no spatial cognicity in this story. What I mean by that is episode two took place in a time and place we knew where it happened in the story. We have like seven different plot points. We don't know if they happen in an alternate timeline, if it's actually happening, if it's in the far future. Nothing makes sense. If this doesn't get wrapped up by the end, it's going to be really dumb. Because then the narrative is impossible to follow. Watching this episode, we have like six different cuts between these alternate reality characters, and then we have one cut of a person actually in you know normal time progression doing things that we're supposed to be taking note of but we don't know that watching we have eight plot points that we're following and we're like okay so this is the one that's actually happening or or what how how the hell am i supposed to know that we do have a tell in the fact that this is a brand new character that came out of nowhere so we can kind of gather that maybe she's kind of important but you know a kid isn't going to be able to follow that he doesn't know what's happening there's so many there's so many cuts uh, and honestly i don't know how you would handle that if you were to rewrite it to make it more obvious that uh, this is the one that's actually happening in time and this is the one that's in this weird uh, illusion sequence in this time storm, as it was. Um, but it's, it's a comment that I had. Uh, but Bell is around and we see that there are Cybermen in this episode and basically uh, the Cybermen, Daleks, and Sontarans are having a big scuffle over uh, what remains of the universe because everything is fucking destroyed, which I don't know how to feel about to be honest. Uh, obviously, it's important that we showcase the threat of the Flux, that it's a big deal. But, uh, you know, it was an immediate threat in Episode 1, and then all of a sudden, everything's already dead. So, as opposed to when all of this dystopian shit happened, we have no idea. And it just kind of came out of nowhere. But we don't need, you know, a progression of, this is the Flux eating the planets, this is everyone running away or dying, uh, this is the Flux after a day of the universe being destroyed, and then this is the flux after a month of people scavenging throughout the system so we went from the flux is attacking people to a month later which so you were missing a bunch in the middle but you know it's it's a nitpick i think uh, and then we cut to vendor's alternate timeline where he is uh talking to a creepy man that looks kind of like benedict cumberbatch from his side profile who are you looks like benedict cumberbatch is that benedict no it's not looks like him from the side uh, i glanced away from my monitor at one point and went is that Benedict Cumberbatch? Uh, but when he turned toward the camera, I was like, oh, no, he looks nothing like him. Uh, but yeah, we have this guy, and basically we're supposed to believe that Vinder is getting instigated into some shady stuff on his planet in his little military uh, career, whatever it is. I haven't rewatched this. Uh, so I was mostly uh, confused, and uh, you can see in my initial reaction, my permanent expression throughout this whole scene is just... Because I didn't know what was happening, and I was trying to figure out any answers. So the actual dialogue, I think I missed most of it, but you can tell by the energy of the scene that uh, this guy has some power, and he's inflicting his power onto Vinder. Vinder doesn't want to do it, but he can't speak up about whatever it may be. Uh, and so we have our first 
major good bullet point that I want you guys to focus on. The dialogue in this episode is mostly good, except for the Doctor's expository dumps. And that is a massive, massive good thing for this episode, that we actually have good scenes. It is so important that the following episodes continue with this. The dialogue is good. Characters have subtlety to their dialogue. Their characters are actually getting depth. There's there's reasons to the words that they're saying. And we as audience members can, can pick and prod at those and come to our own conclusions. It's such a big plus. And this is kind of heavy-handed stuff that we're getting this, you know, big jump to the past where we're seeing the past of all our characters so that we have an excuse to write some depth to them. Uh, I felt like there were better ways that we could have deployed this, if I'm honest. But the dialogue is good, and this is a huge thing for this episode. The dialogue is actually good. It is to a very high caliber, and Vinder especially is written very, very well, and his scenes have a lot of subtext to them, which I fucking appreciate to death. Thank you, Chris Chibnall. Uh, and then after that, we get a Yaz scene where she's playing video games with Sonya, her sister. Okay, how are they writing video games? Um, and then the doctor cuts into the scene, and she's in Sonya's place. So we've been seeing this before with Yaz's stuff. Uh, the doctor just kind of takes the place of characters. And we find out that this is actually the doctor as she's appearing in the time storm, jumping back between people's alternate reality stuff. She's explaining to Yaz that she's in a time storm and that these are you're seeing your past and stuff. Uh, but Yaz says that this is not her past. She's never played video games with Sonya. She doesn't know what's happening. And then the doctor says, yeah, there are details that are wrong for some reason with Yaz's timeline. And then we see a weeping angel in the episode. What the f- Can we go back and see that, please? It's a weeping angel, and it's holding a pistol. What kind of game- what kind of multiplayer game are they playing? Very silly. So we figure out that Yaz is connected to the weeping angels. Uh... Because reasons, we don't exactly know why. I'm assuming this will be either explained or, you know, in some way explored in the following episode, Village of the Angels, which I'm very excited for. Uh, but then we get this whole angel coming out of the TV thing, which is a continuation from Time of the Angels from Flesh and Stone. An image of an angel becomes an angel and all that shit. So uh, Chris Chibnall is actually uh, continuing with that idea, which Stephen Moffat did not do in The Angels Take Manhattan when he made the Statue of Liberty a weeping angel. But this was an exciting scene for me. When I got into it, I was like, oh, a Weeping Angel scene. That's actually tense. Ooh, that was cool. Uh, and it was portrayed well, except for the Doctor's expository stuff about how the Weeping Angels work. I know how they work, and it kind of really detracted from the tenseness of the scene. Uh, but then it completely drops the ball in how it gets resolved. It basically gets resolved in, like, a five-minute, like, super cut of just so many quick cuts of, yeah, it's grabbing the console, smashing it, and then the Angel's gone. You know, exactly how it was done in Time of the Angels. Okay, that was so poorly cut. Uh, and the biggest problem with that is there's just too many cuts. It happens too quickly. I, I literally, I blinked and I missed it. With can, In comparison to the, that whole Time of the Angels scene, that awesome scene where, you know, uh, Amy's looking into the, the monitor, the angel's moving, and then it progressively gets closer, and then it comes out. The door is locked so she can't open the door. She figures out that she can't just switch off the TV, so she has to use her brain and hit it on the blip. And that was a big, you know, frolicking, giant action scene where uh, Amy was an actual threat. Whereas in this scene, this is like literally 10 seconds of an angel scene where uh, the angel comes out of the screen uh, and then it got resolved just as quickly as it got started. So that was a scene that had a ton of potential when it started, but I think in its resolution, completely dropped the ball. Uh, and then we have more of these... Uh, Time storm doctor scenes. I comment how seeing them is my kryptonite because it's basically just, uh, you know, <laughs> intermissions between these plot points where the doctor is saying, What is happening? I need answers. So we get another one of those, and the Mori expositing about how they are the Mori and they're powerful and they control time. And then we cut back to the fugitive doctor on the Temple of Atropos. Uh, where she's encountering Swarm and Azir. And this is in the past. We see Swarm with his old design from episode 1 before he killed the guy, which I think is an objectively better design than the one he has throughout, you know, the present day of this of this uh, series. And so I say, if we're going down this double-down path, you know, the fact that we're doubling down on the idea of the Timeless Child, an idea that everyone hated and, you know, had its own uh, problems, as I'll get into in the remastered video essay, 
Uh, I honestly think it's good that if we're gonna do this, and I hate that we're doing it, to be frank, but if we are gonna do it, it's good that we're actually seeing some of the origins of the Fugitive Doctor so that I actually kind of care. You know, when this character was introduced in episode one, I was just kind of like, oh, he's from the past. But, you know, after seeing the past and their old encounters, when uh, I guess there's a little bit more into it, uh, and it's basically it's basically a good step forward to an idea that I pretty much hate in every single goddamn way. Uh, and I and I continue to say I still don't really care about these skeleton people. Uh, we get some expository stuff about how they're evil and the Temple of Atropos is important, and the Mori are here and they're killing the Mori, and we're supposed to care. Time shall never surrender to space. No. Uh, uh, what? And then the doctor does a big old thing where she uh, tricks them with his big thing where she calls the Mori to action. And then I think it uh, I think it kills them or maybe they flee or something. Uh, but in the scene, we have a big fucking cobweb of all sorts of stuff about th this fucking temple. And I have to say, now that we're kind of getting into it, I think this idea and we have to remember that this is not how Doctor Who was before. But this whole fucking idea that this temple is how time works. And time is controlled by big fucking cosmic interstellar monks. Can we just address the fact that this is so dumb? You know, this is not how time was written in the Russell T. Davies era and the Stephen Moffat era and even in the Chris Chibnall era. You know, time, time is time. It goes forward and it goes back and the Time Lords are people that figured out how to make time travel. So they go back and forth. Time just happens. We have no control over time. And this idea that this f fucking cosmic temple on the planet time is controlled by monks that are in charge of time and if anyone kills the monks time gets destroyed is so fucking stupid so biggest thing about flux that i hate with a passion at this juncture i didn't really understand a lot of it in war of the santarans but in retrospect and especially where this is going in the future i think that this temple idea is really dumb you know the last thing i wanted out of doctor who was a temple that controls the course of time it makes no sense like, on the most fundamental basis, it makes no sense. It's a bonkers idea. Uh, it's very curious to me why Chris Chibnall went that way with his story in Flux. Uh, and then we see Belle. She's in a big Millennium Falcon-esque ship. Uh, the Cybermen board her ship, and she's, she kills them. And she has a big old scuffle with them, and she defeats them. And we have this uh, Cybermen that is still alive and able to give information so uh, bell interrogates this cyberman on what the hell is going on with the flux and i was very adamant to hear what he has to say because i could not follow anything that was established in this episode my first time watching it what is happening to time i mean I get please tell me flux, but... correct flux event affected the planet time temporal center cannot hold no idea what that means okay so the planet time is destroyed by the flux so time is destroyed Okay, so because the, the time, I can't believe all the time is controlled by a fucking temple. This will make any sense. Uh, and then we have a nice little exchange between Belle and the Cyberman, where uh, uh, Belle says her mission is love. Love. Incorrect. Eh. What? Your mission is love. Love is not a mission. Love I agree. <laughs> And then she says that it's all about love and that the Cybermen don't get that because they don't have emotions. I think it was a nice little exchange, especially having seen where this goes in the future. Love is the only mission. Idiots. I guess that's a nice exchange. Uh, and then we see Vinder again. Uh, he's back in this cult thing going on in his planet where he's, he's basically a, a right-hand man to this big evil guy. Uh, again, I wasn't totally following the Vinder stuff, but I got the picture. I'm um, probably gonna have to rewatch this one and figure out what exactly was going on there and why it was so compelling. But I got the idea, and y you'll figure out what I thought about it at the end. But I, you know, I got the picture of it. Tell me, but they have to die. Uh, and then I have a note. I think this episode is a huge improvement because it doesn't have one. Uh, the dumb dialogue, and two, the contrived plots. But I do think that some of the elements of the serialization are kind of sinking this one for me in some ways. 
biggest one is this whole planet called time and the, this this temple is a dumb idea i have to say that i really don't like it and then we continue to have these awesome vendor scenes where he's showing his amazing acting skills and this good subtle dialogue that i'm really fucking appreciating in this episode so i have several several notes of how uh vendor rocks and uh how much i love him i'm sorry this character is so fucking good chibnall make every one of your characters as good as vendor and then we're back with the fugitive doctor on the temple of atropos in the past and then we have a very surprising scene but i was very happy to see it uh, the person that, one of his soldiers that looks like Dan, we know that this is now not Dan because of the weirdness with this whole time storm expository jump in the past thing going on, that uh, these are not uh, the characters as we see them. So the character that looks like Dan has his face, has a uh, dog man's axe, and the doctor says, I've seen that before, because this is our current doctor jumping into the scene and reliving her past. So she pulls the axe from his hand, and the hologram deactivates, and it's Dogman, and I was so fucking happy to see him. Here, I'll, I'll play the clip. Dogman! 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 Oh my god! Write it down, write it down. Dan is Dogman? <laughs> We've come full circle. But yeah, that's where we get the conclusion that Dogman and the Doctor have met before through this whole division sequence, and that uh, he's been here the whole time. Again, we have to ask, where has he been the past 13 incarnations of this 50-year show? Uh, again, huge contrivances that are still feeling the repercussions since the airing of episode 10 of series 12, The, time the Timeless Child, that I hate with a burning passion. Uh, so we just kind of have to look away and say, it's fine, I, I, I guess it makes sense, when it really doesn't, and this should have never happened. Uh, and then we finally get the Doctor leaving this time storm thing where she's spectating everyone's uh, little past here going on. We have some dumb stuff where she's talking about how she wants to go back and get more answers. I didn't really like this exchange. I felt no stakes into this whole time storm with the Mori stuff and this whole void place. But the Doctor gets inserted into a random place. And I'll just let my uh, comments on it as I watched it. Oops, I knocked over my fan. Uh, explain it for me. There is no stakes here. Oh, Jesus. Stop fighting now, Doctor. Who are you? Who the hell are you? Where I are agree. You? I'm telling you, the damage to time is already done. All of this came out of nowhere for this season. It is so dumb. This universe is over, Doctor. Eh. Pandora opens again? Hello? The flux wasn't an accident. It wasn't a naturally occurring event. It was what? made. It was placed. I didn't know that. What? Because of no. You. What? What are you talking about? What? You can get oh, Jesus. More mysteries. So, yeah, we have more mysteries to solve in uh, the flux. Apparently, the doctor is responsible for the flux, and we're going to figure out why as the series goes on. It's probably going to be in relation to the fugitive doctor and the division and dark man and all this fucking stuff from the past uh that is going to get revealed maybe it's gonna turn out that the doctor is a bad man or something or sorry bad woman uh but yeah after that we finally finally go back to the normal progression of time finally finally we're back in the normal progression of time where we're back in this temple where we left off in series two. And we find out that uh, this whole <laughs> nostalgia trip was an intentional decision by Swarm and Azure. I think that's what they're trying to say with this whole weird scene. So that was on purpose. What? But yeah, uh, Swarm and Azure leave after some dialogue. Uh, we see that they have captured Diane and Dan wants to save her because he loves her. And, uh, so they leave, and they don't kill them, of course, because fucking plot armor. They just left? Why didn't they just kill them? Plot armor. Bruh. This is the flaw with making really powerful characters. Uh, so then we have some wrap-up stuff here going on, basically, uh... We finally don't end on a massive... Well, we kind of end on a cliffhanger in a second, but we have, uh... A moment of respite, where all the characters are just kind of walking around, they're all together, uh, they're trying to figure out what to do next. We have Vinder 
and all these characters, um, they have a nice little exchange about where they're going next. Vinder gets introduced to the TARDIS for the first time. He knows what it is because he's an alien and he's been around. So we have this uh, this nice scene where he uh, goes into the TARDIS for the first time. We see that the door is still on the floor, which I again comment on how I like that idea. Is it in the ground again? <laughs> That's so cool. I love that idea. And then we have a weird moment where, uh, again, we're wrapping up this episode and we have some expository dialogue about how we have so many mysteries to solve. And I think this is the only one that I like just because there's just so much that went on in this episode. And I really appreciated this little uh, checkup on what the hell was going on in the story. Uh, and then we have a weird line where Yaz is asking the doctor a question and then, uh, and then the doctor interjects before she can finish and says, can we not have a discussion out of everything. Uh, and then I have a comment. Chris Chibnall realizes that he makes a discussion out of everything. Does everything have to be a discussion? Hey, Chris Chibnall realizes he makes discussions out of everything. And then we finally get the closure for this whole can you repair question from these floating pyramids. It's in reference to the flux. The flux and the temple and everything being destroyed. He, they're asking if they can repair the universe, which I felt was cool. And the doctor's response was quite uh, punctual. I always use punctual in the wrong way. Uh, I guess it's it poignant, but it's not really melancholic. It's just kind of it was a good it was a good response. There, that, that works. I really hope so. Hmm. So we know what can you repair means. Uh, and then we get the absolute best thing out of Flux so far, and I do mean that. This tops Dogman. This tops Liverpool Man, where we find out that uh, with what was going on with Vinder and. The, uh, where he's gotten trapped in regards to the political uh, ranking of his place, where we find out that uh, this whole message that he left for her in his little pod, uh, I, forgot, I, I forgot to talk about that. Basically, uh, Vinder is in his little station. We figure out that he got trapped in that station because of the political stuff that I forgot. <laughs> I didn't really uh, completely uh, catch the first time, but, you know, it was good. I liked it. I thought his dialogue was pretty good and the way that was handled was surprisingly subtle with how dumb Chibnall's run has been in its past and this was very surprising depth that I was not expecting where he's leaving this very heartfelt message to someone his significant other we can gather uh, where he's saying he did what he had to do and that he's sorry and that he loves him and I, uh, I thought that was moving when I first saw it, it even you know removed for the fact that we find out that Belle, the girl that we've been following this whole time through, you know, the normal progression of the story, is Vinder's girl. It's, it's his, his significant other, yeah, his love interest, basically. And that uh, Belle, a survivor of the Flux, is trying to find Vinder. I'm only permitted one message. I would be guest to you. Oh! Belle is Vinder's girl. So that makes sense. Okay. This came full circle. I like this. This is nice. Shit, that's good. Vinder and Belle are epic. Her inclusion in the plot was really good, and Belle and Vinder are very well-written characters, and I thought this emotional through-line throughout this whole story was surprisingly moving, and by far the most moving thing to happen in Chibnall's run. This felt like on the caliber of some of the other moving stuff throughout Doctor Who. I thought this was a really, really compelling connection between these two characters. They were both very well written in the scenes that we saw of them. And we find out, you know, that Belle has a kid, Vinder's kid, and that she's trying to meet Vinder so they can be a family again. So that was really emotional. The score was very good and the performances were good as well. I thought that was a, a fucking great reveal, to be honest. I really, really loved that. And then I have a note. This episode was a course correction for the series. I really, really loved this idea, and I hope throughout Flux, this gets explored. I'm ready. Episode 4. Because this shows so much promise, and Vinder is MVP of Flux so far. I think from the moment I saw him up to this episode, he has been stellar the entire way through. And this whole resolution thing has such strong dialogue. When Vinder gets taken back to his planet, we see that it's been destroyed by the Flux, and we have some really, really uh, subtle dialogue where Vinder is processing, you know, seeing his planet destroyed, 
and I say that dialogue is rooted in character now that we've gotten past the craziness that was the expository Doctor Who-ness of these whole past plots where we're seeing, you know, all these plot points. I think the wrap-up really uh, paid off uh, in a big way for this episode. And I think all of these ending scenes have great, you know, they're ripe with pathos and just have so much emotional resonance to them. So I, I thoroughly enjoyed most of the dialogue in this ending. Uh, and then we have our cliffhanger for the episode. So right after uh, Vinder gets deposited on his home planet, the doctor gives him uh, her phone number so that she he can call if he needs help at all. And then they leave in the TARDIS. We're with Dan, uh, Yaz, and the doctor. And then a weeping angel comes out of Yaz's phone, and then it hijacks the TARDIS controls. <laughs> That's so weird. So we had a big rollicking finale where uh, that happens. The finale is the Weeping Angel is at the console. Uh, the doctor's saying, don't blink. It can move when you blink or something. And it, it grabs the TARDIS. And then uh, <laughs> the doctor says, the Weeping Angel is in control of the TARDIS. And that's the finale <laughs> for that one. So yeah, with this one, I think... There was a ton of elements, especially toward the end, that worked for me a lot. I really love the Belle and Vinder stuff, and I think on a second watching, seeing how her character factors into all this uh, paid off a lot. Uh, I think this whole uh, dystopian future universe thing has a lot of stakes in it all of a sudden, where we find out that the universe is over as we know it, with the whole flux going around and ravaging the whole place. Uh, I felt like when we saw the flux in episode one, there wasn't a lot compelling us to really care about the destruction that we were seeing, aside from the fact that the Earth was going to get destroyed. But now that we see that everything is dead, and uh, we have to fix that, obviously, going forward. Uh, I think the Weeping Angels, some scenes of them were okay, but I think where they're going for in Episode 4 shows promise, in my opinion. Uh, Vinder and Bell were good, obviously. I think some of the expository stuff throughout the plot was good. Some of it was bad well i wouldn't say bad but you know point there's the pointless ones and there's the really really compelling ones so i feel like there was a nice enough variety with these stories i think the way that this was set up was awful oh it just kind of came out of nowhere after the cliffhanger of episode two we come from episode two and we're just fucking slingshotted into this big seven plot uh story following these alternate timelines and weird new characters that look like old characters and a bunch of mysteries that we were expected to solve but in the way that it wrapped up i think most of the answers of this one were uh wrapped up i think a lot of people are going to overhype the shit out of this one because of its high concept this whole oh it's alternate timelines that's so cool this is the best shit episode just because it did a cool idea the execution is one thing i think this is a very good episode but it's you know, it's still Chibnall quality. There were some very good characters. Dialogue was very, very good. But I don't want anyone to overrate this one. It wasn't, you know, on the end of some of the better episodes of Doctor Who. This is still kind of... It just did what it did well. And that's fine enough, but it, it wasn't the stellar quality that, you know, I've come to expect from, uh, you know, Moffat's run, RTD's run. But that's fine. You know, I, I'm, I'm looking at this in... What I'm expecting from Chibnall, I think this is an improvement, and it shows promise in the future for Flux. Uh, that was my opinion. I think this might be a polarizing one. I obviously am making this after just watching it, so I don't know how people feel about it. I don't know if people think it's convoluted and pointless and just a complete and utter ex uh, plot mess, or that it's cool, has good dialogue, and sets up promising things, which is kind of how I, I'm kind of in the middle, but more on the end of I think this was a better one that uh was very a good watch honestly so yeah that was episode three uh very interesting one in comparison to episode two i am 100 percent convinced that with this one people are going to be like holy shit doctor who was good again everybody let's calm down okay i think episode two was awful i think episode one was misguided i think this one was better but i don't want anyone to get too overhyped you know, we really have to look at these objectively, you know, just because a series has some serialization, a plot happening from episode to episode doesn't mean the execution is good, the dialogue is good, or any 
facet of it is good other than the fact that the mysteries are there you know we've all seen series six of doctor who and while i do love series six's episodes um just because it has mysteries doesn't mean that it's a good series in terms of its serialization so i think people are really really banking on the fact that oh we have mysteries therefore it is good uh, i think chibnall is handling that fairly well uh with a few missteps a i.a the last episode more of this on Tarns, but i think this one has really uh, changed my mind on Flux in some ways. Other ways, not so much, but I, I enjoyed it. I'm, I don't have too many huge problems with this one that aren't, you know, problems with Chibnall's Doctor Who Flux at large. So, uh, yeah, that was this one. Hope you enjoyed my review. Hope I was fair. Hope I wasn't too forgiving or unforgiving. Uh, I noticed that I kind of get a little tunnel vision on some of the bad stuff, but I, you know, going through these point by point, I think a entire picture of the episode is gained and you know there's some value to that so my voice is absolutely shredded if you can't tell i've been talking for an hour and 13 minutes i enjoy doing these long ones because uh looking back on what i had to say you know it gives me a complete picture of how i felt about it and then i can insert where i feel in terms of you know as time goes on later and by the end of flux when we have the whole picture we'll really be able to look back and say Oh, that was a dumb idea. Why did that one get established there if it was going this way? Anyway, I've been rambling on and on for no reason. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, next week, I'll be back with Village of the Angels, our Weeping Angels solo story. It is to be determined. I hope it's good. I hope it doesn't go down the rabbit hole of you know, Weeping Angels stories in the future where they just go down and down. I love Time of the Angels and Flesh and Stone more than Blink. I have a video essay in production, as, it's, as it was, um, on that, but I do think Angels Take Manhattan was for the angels, so let's hope Chibnall doesn't do dumb things with the angels. I am just praying to God that you know this one's good, but we'll see, and I'll review it when it comes out, you know, the day after Naturally With these, so I can edit them and do this. But yeah, that's it. Hope you enjoyed. Bye-bye. Now oh, my voice is shredded. <laughs>